Ehsan, and I'm your host today on the webinar. I'm pleased uh, to start our webinar session with you and in the same time welcome our guest, Dr. Rada Mihalcha. And this series of talks are conducted by Shahid Beheshti University NLP Lab, uh, which is supervised by Dr. Shamsberg. I would ask her to introduce uh, the lab and the talk series to you, uh, to Dr. Shamsberg. Hello, everybody. I'm Mehru Shamsfard, the head of Natural Language Processing Research Laboratory of Shahid Beheshti University in Tehran. First of all, I would like to welcome all of you, especially our dear guest, Professor Rada Mihalcia, to the first NLP talk of SBNLP Lab. The research path of our lab in the past 15 years has passed through different aspects of natural language processing and computational linguistics, with more attention to semantics, pragmatics, and knowledge-rich understanding. Although in many cases, our achievements are language independent, uh, our special focus is on low resource languages, uh, especially on Persian as our mother tongue. In these years, SBU NLP Lab has developed several language resources, such as corpora, datasets, lexicons, and Farsnet, the Persian WordNet, besides fundamental tools for Persian pre-processing and end user applications, such as question answering systems, uh, plagiarism detection, spell correction, text summarization, expert finding, intelligent assistance, dialogue systems, and so on. Today, it's my honor to introduce and start NLP Talk series. NLP Talk is a series of professional talks in natural language processing and computational linguistic topics to be held regularly. The main aim of holding and hosting this event is to make wide and strong connection between different stakeholders of the ecosystem from the academy and industry. We would like to make new relations, new opportunities for collaboration and cooperation on research projects, on industrial projects, and on education. Although there are several careers, meetings, and symposiums to make people gather and exchange their knowledge, and experiences. Yet another one is not superficial. The main characteristic of NLP talk is knowledge exchange and open new collaboration doors to various people and labs with the same interests and let them know each other. In other words, NLP talk is going to spread knowledge from well-known NLP research figures by presenting about their research, um, the research topics, insights, and latest achievements in the field. And let me let new groups and the connections to be formed. It's my pleasure to thank Rhoda for accepting my invitation and have her in this webinar. And I'm very excited to listen to her speech. Thank you, everybody. And back to Essa. They're recording now. Thank you. I will share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, very well. Yes. All right. Okay, so um, today I wanted to talk about um, a topic that's fundamental in natural language processing, um, which um, is that of word representations and word embeddings. And this is a core concept that we have been building upon for a very long time. Um, in fact, we have been talking about word representations um, even since I would say the beginning of natural language processing. Uh, we may not have called them word embeddings, um, but representations of words were there um, since we were talking about how words were uh, present in documents, how we could use vectors, primarily in the context of information retrieval um, to represent um, all these words and relations between words. And so originally what we've seen, I would say perhaps around the 
um, 50s and 60s is the representation of words as vectors that would indicate their presence in a collection of documents. Um, then we sort of evolve into more sophisticated representations, which were primarily based on distributional semantics. Um, and then more recently, we have been talking about word embeddings. Um, the term itself emerged maybe around 10 years ago, uh, but it really means a representation of words in a vector form, which allows us to compute with words. Um, and I know many of you here in the audience are familiar with natural language processing concepts, um, but still for having everyone on the same page, I will still briefly introduce um, the core idea behind this, um, this word embedding. And what I would like to do today um, is to talk about these representations, both from the angle of how successful they have been, um, but also from the angle of how they are aspects of word embeddings that as a community, we haven't been really paying enough attention to. And I would like to make the argument that we should start paying more attention to all these aspects of word embeddings um, that will eventually make for a successful representation um, to support successful applications of NLP. And so that's really the insight of this title, the ups and downs. Um, there is both the fact that word embeddings currently are not very robust, so they have ups and downs, uh, but also the fact that we don't only see advantages, there are also disadvantages in the current representation. So just to bring everyone on the same page, and again, some of you may be very well familiar um, with this idea. Um, what we currently do in terms of producing word representations um, is to use neural networks. And this is based on a very simple uh, but powerful idea, um, which is that we can learn the semantics of a word by looking at its neighborhood words. So we look at the context and based on that, we can learn what a word means. And if we look at a lot of such context, we can learn a lot about the word. And so what we have, and this is what you see here, um, is a simplified diagram of word to back, um, which is a neural network based representation that's been around for um, about 10 years now, it's been introduced in 2013. And there are two flavors of it. Um, one, which considers the context as input. So looking at words in the context, you'd want to predict the target words, so the word that you are focusing on, or vice versa, looking at the word, you would want to predict the word in the neighborhood. And so with this, like I said, really simple idea, we can basically generate a lot of training data from which we can learn what this word really means. So if we focus on one word, then we can look at a lot of examples where it occurs at its context, and then we can learn with these automatically generated examples, we can learn what it means. So eventually what we end up with, we end up with vectors that will represent the meaning of the word, and one famous example that we've been seeing floating around that would demonstrate the powerful of these representations um, is how we can compute with words. For instance, if we take the vector for king and we subtract the vector for men and add the vector for the word woman, then we get a vector that is very similar, very close to the vector for queen. And so this was used as a demonstration um, to show how with embeddings, we can learn what king means, what man means, woman means, and um, getting this computation. Now, if we look at the kind of research that's been happening um, around word embeddings, um, we see that over time it's simply skyrocketing. And so this um, is a very simple query that I posed against Google Scholar. And we can see um, starting for the past um, eight, nine years, um, I should have used the years here. The last column is 2020. 
So the uh, rightmost column would represent number of publications that included the phrase word embeddings um, from, from last year. And you can see how it's been um, increasing um, very quickly. Now, another thing that we can do is to look where are these word embeddings used. It's pretty hard to look at this immense number of publications. Um, one very simplified way of looking at it um, is, for instance, to create a word cloud for titles. And we could see here that, of course, we get language and vectors um, and models, which are some of the core ideas behind word embeddings. And then we also see a lot of other, um, other tasks that have been enabled by this, which would be, for instance, um, semantics, we see similarity, we see classification, um, sentiment analysis. Um, we also see cross-lingual and multilingual methods. Um, we see some of the um, biomedical work, which has been enabled by um, word embeddings and, and so forth. So one way of looking at all the progress that we've been um, we've been seeing here um, is to consider how we advanced from where we were many years back. Um, so for instance, as a visual approximation, um, when we started on word representation, maybe we were in a position like this, where we had all these pockets of knowledge um, about how to create a vector for a word, or maybe how to do some vector operations on how such vectors could be used, for instance, to measure similarity between words or how um, to do classification tasks or other, um, other tasks in perhaps natural language understanding or natural language generation. And as um, time progressed, um, we moved on to a more advanced state. Um, so we get to a more perfect or well-rounded um, view of the problem with significant advances that have been made both in the representation of this of words um, and also in the use of these representations in downstream applications. Um, and again, we continue to make progress and eventually we got to this even more perfect place um, with even more advances. For instance, for the past few years, we have been seeing how we can use contextualized word embeddings and learn even representations that are aware of the immediate context and will change from one context to, to the next. And with this kind of representation, we've seen correspondingly a lot of progress in understanding and, and generation. Now, a way to look at it would be, well, it's a solved problem. Um, I have everything in place, um, I'm done. Uh, but another way to look at it is to see that this is actually a facet from a bigger problem. So the analogy that I want to make here is with the Rubik's cube. Some of you may know how to solve it, um, some not, but at least you are familiar with this idea of how there are multiple facets that would need to be solved. And so it does take a long time for one to learn how to do a facet, maybe not that long, um, but then it gets more and more complicated on how to keep facets um, in this more perfect place um, and solve the other facets as well. Um, so I really, I believe that that's where we are uh, when it comes broadly in AI um, and specifically in natural language processing and even more specifically when we talk about this core um, concept within natural language processing, which is that of word representations. So we have addressed what facet, which primarily has to do with accuracy of system. So we've been seeing um, steady advances when it comes to, um, for instance, how we measure similarity between words on benchmarks that we have in natural language processing. Uh, we've seen consistent progress over time. The same applies to applications such as classification using word embeddings um, or generation. Um, however, there are a number of aspects that are essential to having um, robust representations that 
have been addressed to some extent, but we haven't made um, enough progress. So my arguments today is that we should start looking more closely at all these other aspects of world representations. And I will take one class at a time and um, take a look at where we are today and what are some of the problems. So one aspect um, is interpretability. And just to illustrate my point, um, I want you to take just a moment to think about what this word brings to mind. So we could all agree perhaps that it's cat is an animal. We could look up the definition in the dictionary. Um, we could also say perhaps that cat is related to the concept of dog. Then there will also be some more personalized representations. Um, like you may think of your own cat or you may have a preferred color for a cat and so on and so forth. Um, but it does bring to mind for each of us um, some connotations and um, associated words. Now here will be another one. Again, we can do the same exercise. When we see fire, um, there is of course the meaning of fire and then there are different associations we can make with fire, whether it's cooking or fire we have seen in a, um, in a movie. So it's um, again, various associations that we'll make. Now here is another um, word. Um, so on this one, you can look as long as you'd want, um, the same I would do, and we can't really say much about what this really means. So the question is, how would we interpret a vector like this? And that's really the challenge that we have with word embeddings, that they are not necessarily interpretable. So they have embedded meaning, um, which comes clear when we try to compute either similarities or classifications, but by themselves are not interpretable. So we cannot really tell um, even within the same training process, when we get different embeddings for the same word, we cannot really tell how much progress we have made, what did we learn, what is the meaning of all these um, items that we have in the vector and the numbers that we see there. And there has been some progress trying to look at attention and seeing to which part of the vector certain algorithm would pay more attention to. Um, but it's still far from what we've seen um, when we look, for instance, at the word cat or fire and what that brings to mind. So the question is really, what are these um, embeddings representing and what do they really mean? Um, we know that the vectors pack a lot of meaning because we can use them in meaningful ways. But when we look inside the vector, um, what can we read from there? And even when it comes to relations, um, the example that I showed, which is a fairly traditional by now example for showing distance between these embeddings, um, we'll say, okay, king and queen are related. Uh, but then when we think about king and castle, um, how are they related and what kind of relation do we have? Um, it's even getting more complicated when we think of word in opposition if we take a representation for north and a representation for south, what would we expect from the corresponding vectors? What should be the relation to reflect the fact that they are semantically related, uh, but they mean opposite, they have opposite meaning. And of course, if we start looking at even more advanced relations, here is our good old word net and all the semantic relations that are represented here, um, we will see a lot of different possible relations like hyperneme, toponyms, entailments, um, domain relations, antonyms, and, and so forth. So having the ability to encode all these relations is still a, um, a challenge. Now, aside from the vectors themselves and how we use them to relate words, there is also the question of how we use embeddings in downstream applications. Uh, we've seen that these representations are 
sometimes used um, as features, for instance, for applications such as sentiment analysis, other text classification problems, um, and a variety of tasks. So wherever we need some way of representing words, whether by themselves or in a paragraph or a document, we are using these um, embeddings. And it seems that the and downstream applications are learning something from them. But then when it comes to interpreting what is being learned and how are they useful, then things are getting a little harder because we cannot really tell um, what does it mean. So for instance, if we were to do either an ablation study or look at weights in a machine learning algorithm applied on top of an embedding, and we find that say position number seven and 18 in an embedding are the ones that are driving the classification because they end up with a higher weight. What does that tell us? So which part of a word are more important if we have those, um, those positions? There is also the, um, the issue that we have with how we go across spaces. So currently word embeddings are trained within a space. And if we want to use them on another data, we'll somehow have to either retrain or represent in our pre-trained space. And so that in itself is a challenge that um, does not give us a lot of flexibility. So the point here is that one facet that's still unsolved and there has been progress, um, but it's still not as advanced as we'd like it to be is how we can interpret um, these representations, whether by themselves um, or when used in, in applications. Now here is another, um, if people have questions, uh, feel free to put them in Q&A and I'll try to address them as I go, uh, or we can address them at the end. So another facet um, is that of generalizability. And by that, I mean using representations that we create, for instance, within a domain on a certain corpus um, to use them on other domain or generally other data. And much of what we've seen, it's really driven by a certain finite set of applications. So we've seen, for instance, um, embeddings that have been pre-trained on Wikipedia or on Google News, and they tend to work reasonably well on applications that are around similar domains. Now, when we move to a different domain, things are not working um, equally well. And here is an example from a paper uh, by Zhang and colleagues from 2019, where they looked at similarity of words. So really taking the fundamental way of connecting word embeddings um, by measuring how far they are um, with respect to how far they should be according to human evaluators. And um, what they've seen here is that taking the pre-trained word to vac which has been trained on a very large collection of documents and has been used widely. Um, so that's what we will see here in the first row. So if we take the Google News train word embeddings, um, we actually get pretty poor performance. So on a data set that consists of words from the medical domain, which has been labeled for how close those words should be according to human experts, this particular uh, pre-trained embedding performs very poorly. So we see Pearson and Spearman correlations, uh, which would indicate how close the algorithm is to the human gold standard is, is fairly low. And the way that um, this was improved significantly, getting it to the 0.6 Pearson and Spearman correlations is by training on data that was coming from the medical domain. Now you will say, well, no surprise here. Of course, even for people, it works the same way. Um, I'm an expert in AI, natural language processing. I'm by no means an expert in the medical domain. So if you were to ask me, even as a human, questions in the medical domain, I'll probably fail. Um, however, it also speaks to the fragility of these um, 
representations that they are not really generalizable. So whenever we come with a new problem, unless we have enough data to retrain on that new problem, um, then really the kind of performance we get, it's, um, it's pretty low. So um, before I move on, um, I want to make sure that we have an understanding that is a question on how should we train machine learning models on word embeddings? Um, and in general, the way this is done, it's really using them as input to a traditional machine learning. So you could have like, for instance, a linear regression or multivariate regression or some other algorithms that would use the embeddings themselves as features, possibly along with, um, with others. Um, and oftentimes, We've used the pre-trained embeddings, which is what we can download, for instance, for word to vec They are one click away where we get the embeddings for words, or they can be fine-tuned or post-trained on our own data. But eventually what we end up with, even with that process, is a vector of a vector representation for each word in the vocabulary, uh, which we'll use in the downstream applications. So in terms of um, out of vocabulary words, um, often time they are not handled well, and that's what we see. Um, there is the question really of what we even consider as out of vocabulary. And because these representations are very heavily based on data, Often what we see when training word embeddings is that even words that have low frequency would mark, be marked as out of vocabulary. So they would not be attempted um, at learning or embedding. And so it's not only the question of out of vocabulary. So you, if you see a word for the first time, the most you can do is infer its meaning from its context. And that's something that can be done, like really compose a meaning from the vectors of its context. Um, but we also see words that occur just a few times in the training data. And so the question is what to do for those. We have seen them before, uh, what to do with that. And there has been work that looked at word of learning on how to address um, words that occur just a few times. Um, and depending on where you put them in training, you may get representations that are reasonably, um, reasonably robust. And I'll talk more about that. Um, a bit later about robustness. Um, and one more question in terms of languages, does a word and its translation another language would have the same vector? And this is a great question. I think it's been a question that we've been thinking about as a community for a long time on how to map words from different languages to the same concept space. And of course, there is the, I mean, more broadly speaking, not necessarily related to word embeddings, um, is the question of how different words really, even if we agree on the meaning, they would have different shades. So for instance, my example of the word um, cat, maybe would agree on what would be the meaning in Romanian and Farsi and English. And so maybe we can create this concept space where we map the translations. But then there are words that have different, slightly different meanings. So if we take something such as um, patriotism or ambition or other such words, they would have slightly different meaning in different, um, in different cultures. And so mapping those together um, is more challenging. Now specifically for word embeddings, um, that has been a challenge in itself how we map between different embedding spaces. So if I train a word embedding on English, um, what do I do with that vector if I want to apply on say a collection of Farsi or if I want to uh, apply a collection of um, Chinese and so on. And so that has been challenging. There is work now that attempts to train multiple languages at once. Um, so we can train 
representations by putting in say a hundred different languages. And there are then representations that can be used in all those hundred different languages. So there is some progress that has been made there, but it's still not clear on whether the representation of a word from one language is really the same as the representation of that word from, uh, from another language. All right, so I will move on. There is also a comment here. There is also a CCA method for mapping representations in different domain, and, and that's true. Thank you for that. So continuing on my generalizability um, idea, we've seen this first um, on going from general English to the biomedical domain. Um, there is also this <clears throat> recent work from ACL last year that looked at uh, machine translation evaluation across domains. And here we had data coming from uh, five different domains and looking at how training on one domain um, and testing on another domain, the kind of performance we get. And what we see here which is not surprising with respect to the state of the art where we are now, is that the, where we see the best performance is the diagonal, almost. There is one exception here for the Quran. So training on these domains and testing on the domains indicated on the columns, in general, we would get the best performance by staying within the domain. And if we jump across domains, then we lose a lot of, of accuracy. So for instance, if we train on medical domain, and test on IT, we get significantly lower performance. So we see here, for instance, 11.4, comparing to staying within the same domain where we get 56.5. So the point here really is that um, in general, we don't see a lot of flexibility in these representations. Uh, when we train a word embedding on one domain, it does not transfer well to another domain um, and that really means that it's difficult to create embeddings for domains where we have limited data. Ideally, we would want to just move on with one set of representations and apply problems in different domains, but that doesn't work very well um, as, as we've seen. And then of course, there's also the question of what does in-domain really means? Um, does it mean to stay on the same topic, on the same style? Um, is it staying within the same culture, speaking of different languages, different countries, is it staying on the same level of formality? So that in itself um, is, um, is a question. So um, before I move on, uh, one more question on how can we find different senses of one word um, with word embeddings? There are different ways of thinking about it. Um, when we were looking primarily at the general word embeddings, like say glove or word to vec, um, one way of doing that is to try to bend the word embedding toward a certain sense. Like for instance, finding the, uh, an embedding that it would be closer to a cluster of words where clustering would be one way of getting senses. Um, and otherwise, which is the more recent way of looking at it, is with um, using contextualized word embeddings. Uh, for instance, Elmo or Bert, when there is a lot of variations around Bert, they are contextualized, meaning that they would change from one context to the next. And so eventually they would change for different senses of the word. It will not be necessarily the kind of sense that you will find in a dictionary. So it's not that, for instance, if we have a word like interest, um, would say for English, maybe it has six different meanings. It's not that we have six different embeddings. It's more like having a different embedding for a different occurrence of a, of a word. So it's that way of, um, of representing senses. All right, so let me move on um, to the next um, aspect, um, which is that of fairness. And this has been getting more and more of Attention, and I'm, I'm glad to see that. Um, it's within the context of ethics and NLP. We've seen work on, um, for instance, bias in word embeddings. And this is an example from a paper from a few years ago that primarily look at the kind of bias that is encoded 
um, in embeddings and specifically looking at gender bias. So the way they approach this, they try to plot words on these two different axes. Uh, one that has to do um, with gender. So it will have left and right would be, um, would be gender. And so we'll have she and, um, and he. So she would be on the left and he on the, on the right. And they put here words that would be in English would have an sort of innate meaning that is gendered. So for instance, if I say son, that means a um, male uh, child. If I say daughter, that means a female child. Um, similarly, wife and husband would have gender. So here we'll see these words that have um, gender. And then there are a lot of words, which is a majority in English, that do, are not gendered words. So they do not necessarily have um, associated with them or in them a gender. So for instance, if we talk about arrival or tweet or letters, um, that is not in the word themselves. And so the way they approach this is try to create a representation for the two genders. So considering only this, um, these two gender, male and female, and then see where other words would sit um, on this plot. And what they found is that there are words that are not gendered, um, and yet they have some bias. So for instance, we would see words like genius um, or um, brilliant that sit on the he side. So that would be um, a biased word masculine. So genius and brilliant being more often used to refer to, um, to males than females. And of course, there are the examples that made it even to the paper title where men was found to be similar to computer programmer in the same way as a woman was found to be similar to homemaker. And there are a number of other examples in this work, but also in follow-up works that looked at similar um, bias and how it's really encoded in the representation. So those vectors that we work with actually have that bias in them. And this is really an open problem. I don't have a whole lot to say in the sense that there is ongoing work. Um, so far, a lot of the work has focused on, on gender bias. Um, we have in my lab ongoing work that's looking at ethnical bias. Um, and that's harder to capture also because there aren't really words that encode ethnicity in a natural way. The same that say, for instance, son and daughter would encode gender. Um, there are other dimensions uh, where bias can manifest itself, um, which do not have the same um, clear representation. Um, now there is a question why we see boys and daddy in the middle. Um, so that is a good question. There are other things that um, are interesting about this plot if you start looking at, at words. So this was really, the, the map was created really by relating words and the distance they have to certain seed words that were selected by the authors. And so you would get interesting behavior, like for instance, daddy being in the middle, the one that I've been discussing a lot with my students and other people, I cannot really find it here. Um, so there are certain words, which I would say are fine to be more on the say, for instance, female side. So there are certain words that here came up as being biased, like dress, for instance, and it's understandable that in certain culture, dress would be also associated with male, but they are even determining whether a word is biased in the first place. Um, it's an interesting question in itself. So if we talk about debiasing, which is the ongoing conversation on this topic, do we want to debias everything or are there certain words which is fine to be biased? Um, like for instance, including the seed words that were used here, like son and daughter, do we want to debias them so they lose the, the gender property? Probably not. 
um, and the same goes for, for other words. So this is an open question and I think it's a very rich space of exploration. So if any of you are interested, there is some work that was done beyond what I'm mentioning here, uh, but there is a lot to a lot more to do. All right, so moving on, um, next facet is robustness. And this has to do with the extent to which word embeddings are stable across spaces. So ideally we would want this behavior where we create a vector for a word, and then we can rely on that vector to sort of stay the same, even if we move between domains or if we move between say, algorithms or training seeds. And it turns out that this is really not the case. So this is um, work that is coming um, out of my lab, uh, led by Laura Burdick, looking at the instability of word embeddings. And the way we define stability is to take the word in the neighborhood of a word. So for instance, if we take the word international, we can look at what are the closest words. So we can take the top 10 uh, closest words and maybe we find society, Egyptian, national, Philadelphia, and all these other words here. And then we repeat the training process. So again, we create an embedding space um, and do the same thing. We take the word international and say, okay, what are the closest words? And this time we find again, metropolitan, but we also find maybe Chicago and state and some other words. So stability means that between given the same word and two embedding spaces, so training two separate times, and that could be, like I said, different seeds, maybe different data sources, more or less data, um, how much overlap we get between neighbors. And so here, for instance, we see that out of top 10, we have an overlap of four. So we would say for this word, for, it has a stability of 40%. So that's how much we find in common between the related, the most closely related words for this, um, for this word. Um, so the problem that we see is that many common embedding algorithms have large amounts of instability. Um, and this is one example where we plotted instability um, or stability on the um, entry bank. And so the way to read this, we'll see here is the frequency of a word. So for instance, a word that occurs a few times would be on the left of the graph. A word that occurs many times would be more on the right of the graph. And then would be the stability of the word. So I showed you the example earlier with a word that had a stability of 0.4, 40%. Um, the stability can vary widely from instable to highly stable. And then we would put in buckets, so a dark, little point here would mean there are a lot of words in that bucket. Um, if it's a lighter bucket, then it means there are a few words. So we see that there is some variation with frequency, but not a lot. Um, and really the question that we address here is what are some properties that are associated with, um, with stability? So we formulated this um, problem in, in this way. So we have this observation that we can make on a plot, uh, but we wanted to learn more. And so we said, let's train a lot of embeddings on different data sources with different algorithms and see what kind of observations we can draw. So we had domain data coming from six domains. Um, we had three different algorithms, where to vec uh, which is, I, I mentioned earlier, um, GLAV, which is another word embedding um, coming from Stanford, and then PPMI, which is the um, pointwise mutual information. And what we've done for each, like each training um, instance, so every time we train a model, uh, we recorded words for which we knew the stability, so we could measure, so we had a word, we had an algorithm, and then we had the data that we use for that model. 
And so we could measure then the stability of a word because we will know how stable that word is for a pair of embedding spaces. So for instance, take the word cat. Um, we create a representation with using say, Business New York Times, and then we create another representation using Pantry Bank. If we put them side by side for this particular word, we can say how stable it is between these two embedding spaces. We can also record some properties of the word, for instance, how frequent it was in each of the data sets, um, what is a part of speech, maybe some morphological properties and so forth. And what this does, it gives us training data for a meta learning. So learning on top of these. And with that, then we can start learning insights into what really makes a word embedding stable. So before I move on, um, there is a question, isn't instability a result of hubness in a high dimensional space? Um, I think I'd love to take this question later um, so we can talk more about it. I'm not sure I fully understand what this, um, this refers to. Um, it is a measure of how connected it is to other words, but it's not only. So that will also have to do with frequency of the word. And what we found, and I'm spoiling my results, is that there is more to it than, than frequency. Uh, but I'd love to, talk, to come back to this um, at the end of the, the presentation. And so we had um, all these um, features of an embedding space going in a learning process. We use a regression and we found that it fit well. So we got an um, R squared score of 0 0.3. Um, and that seems to indicate that um, it's fitting well the model. So from here, we could learn a few things. One, which is what I just stated earlier, that frequency is not a major factor in stability. So if we use the frequency of a word in this model, we get the 0 0.3. Uh, but if we don't use the frequency, it's about the same, which may indicate the frequency might be redundant with other properties that are encoded. Um, but also looking at the model with only the frequency. So if we only use the frequency of a word and attempt to predict how stable the word would be, um, that will not um, give us a very good result. So it's just a R square of 0 0.008, which indicates the frequency is not a major drive for, um, for stability. Uh, what we found instead is that curriculum learning is important. And curriculum learning refers to the order of training instances. So depending on how you feed the training instances in the algorithm, you'll get different um, representations and corresponding different stabilities. And it turns out that this is something that does matter. Um, so here is um, what we've seen. Um, what we see on the x-axis is position in training data. So for a given word, we look at where it appeared in the training data. So we had an average. So for instance, say I have a thousand words and some of them appear multiple times. If I pick one word, I could see it was shown first to the neural network. Then it was also shown as example 1001. And then it was also shown as example 2037 and so forth. So I take all these positions and average, and that will tell me like, what was the position of this word in the training data? And we see that there is a relation between stability and where it appears in the training data. So According to this, where that would appear um, later um, would tend to have a higher stability. We also find that stability within domains is greater than across domain, which aligns with what I was mentioning earlier um, for within versus across domains, um, the property that we see with respect to accuracy, and that seems to hold also in terms of robustness, like how stable these embeddings are. Um, one of, the, I would say, the more surprising results is that part of speech is a big factor in stability. Different parts of speech have different stability. So for instance, numbers would have the higher stability, uh, but words like particles and conjunctions have lower stability. Um, and that, personally, I found it the more interesting finding um, 
as to how varied this can be um, by part of speech. We also found differences in algorithms. Um, so GLAV, for instance, seems to be the more stable embedding algorithm compared to say word to vec um, So nowadays in my lab, when we don't use contextualized word embeddings, um, if we choose one of the previous ones, we always go with GLAV just because we found that it's significantly more stable than others. So we see here um, average stability of 65% compared to um, here 29. And then there is also the question of stability in different languages. And that's the more recent work that we have done where we took um, data in different languages, drawing primarily from the Bible, which has translations in many different languages and also from Wikipedia. Um, and I won't attempt to explain this necessarily. I really love these plots. They look very colorful, plotting stability for all these different languages, uh, but we found a very wide stability metric across languages. So for instance, in Lithuanian, we have um, a stability of 5.9, um, whereas Vietnamese has a stability of 23.3. Um, so it's a pretty wide variation. And before I move on, let me take this um, question. Is the analysis of stability performed on non-ambiguous words or how does ambiguity affect stability? Um, we have not removed ambiguous words. Um, what uh, we did, we tried to encode the um, number of meanings. So that is a property that we encoded in the regression but we didn't find um, a very strong association with that. So we took it as num number of words that are reflected in WordNet for a word. So we just tried to model it um, in the regression, but we didn't do anything about it. And I would agree that that is something that um, may vary. And it would be interesting to look a little bit closer as to the stability of highly ambiguous words versus words that are um, non-ambiguous. And that's something that we've done to some extent, but there is more to explore there. So it's, it's a very good point that it can, um, it can vary across words. Right, so I'm getting closer to an end. Um, I also wanted to talk about another facet of um, creating these representations, which is environmental and financial cost. And that is not coming out as often as I think it should uh, because it is a major factor. Um, I also think it's a factor that is leading um, currently computational use is leading toward a monopoly in AI, um, which I'm taking an issue with. Um, there are certain models that can only be run by very big companies. Um, and aside from the fact that there is this direction of monopoly, there is also the um, energy that it implies. And this is, um, these are results from a paper that M.I. Strubel and colleagues from 2019 that looked at different models that we commonly use in NLP and what is the um, environment footprint. So how much uh, carbon dioxide is, is being used. And it has also been translated into um, things that we will do on a regular life. For instance, air travel implies about 2,000 pounds of carbon dioxide if we do from between say, New York and San Francisco. Um, and then you can also see um, in the table here at the bottom of the slide, different models. Um, for instance, if we see BERT, which is contextualized word embedding, um, even like the base model, training that, how much power it would imply and what is the cost. Um, so it's going up to 10,000. 10, um, and then we see also the more advanced models that would require petabytes of compute um, and can get to millions in training. So this is cost of compute, um, but really in terms of environment, there is this column here, which is the carbon footprint which can get enormous 
So at some point, then there's also the question, like how much are we solving and how much are we damaging um, with these models, which I think it really should be upfront in models that we build. We should say more than just, oh, this model is more accurate than previous models, but we should also say, is this model consuming more energy than previous models? And here is a chart from a very recent paper, GPT-3, which is a um, generation model. And it's showing the total compute used during training uh, by this model. And you see petaflops that are being used and how it's growing from like, across different models. So we, he, here is BERT and variations, which is this contextualized word embeddings. And then we see T5. Uh, which is another um, language model used for uh, primarily information extraction. And then we see here GPT-3, which is a generation model. And something that I found that was interesting um, is that if you read the paper for GPT-3, at some point it says that they found a bug in the system, uh, but they could not afford to fix the bug uh, because retraining would have cost another million or more. And so they had to work with that bug and really account in the evaluation for the bug they found, um, which I think is very telling for how we even develop this kind of system. Um, and I think it's something to consider that efficiency really matters. Um, here, what we see in this chart is from, again, another recent paper on green AI, looking at how many papers would report an accuracy versus on efficiency uh, or both. And we see this bias that we have as a community, not only NLP, but also AI toward reporting accuracy figures, like systems that are getting better and better and better, which is all exciting, uh, but there is a lot that's hiding behind that improvement in accuracy. Um, and we should also report on these other aspects. Um, and it's also the factor that I mentioned earlier that currently not many institutions um, can afford to build these very large deep learning models. So who can afford, for instance, to rerun GPT-3 um, if we were to change anything in the parameter setting or training data and so forth. And so that not only has impact on efficiency and environment, uh, but also has direct implications on equality and diversity. So who's really behind these models? And like I said, who can afford to run them? So I will now conclude and go back to my original analogy. And so what we see uh, where we are now is where we have this one facet that it's getting close to perfection, which is really accuracy of systems. And we see reports of steady improvements, um, but we should really consider the fact that there are all these other facets um, that need a lot more work for the whole cube to be perfect. Um, and one way of doing that is, I would argue, for bringing back the secret NLP weapons. And by that, I mean a lot of resources um, that have been created over many years of research, um, which somehow for the past five years, we seem to have forgotten about them. Um, there is almost like a community amnesia. Um, so for instance, there are all these lexical resources that encode a lot of knowledge from linguists and lexicographers, and it's they're really very rich and sitting there that we could use. Um, there are a lot of taggers and segmenters and parsers. You know, for instance, your, your lab is um, working on language specific um, tools, yeah, the lexical networks. And this is just to enumerate a handful of um, methodologies that have been developed, which currently, so if we look at what NLP is doing literally this day, so say this year, last year, we don't really use a lot of these nowadays. We primarily rely on this um, very data-driven way of approaching problems. Um, so in general, I would argue for really bringing back language, so looking more than just a set of vectors that we learn, um, but actually looking at what is that's driving these vectors, which is language. And so my hope is that we'll eventually emerge and evolve from this state to this state. 
um, which really means, and I think that is something that will happen naturally and we have to admit it and be aware of it, um, that as it happens when you solve the Rubik's cube, in order to solve other facets, you'll have to somehow mess up the facet that you have. So say we have the white face solved, we may lose some, so we may lose in accuracy, but that will really mean that we'll get more robust and generalizable and fair systems. And I think that will be a major win. So we should not see the fact that we get systems that are lower in accuracy as a loss, um, given that we are now gaining in this other um, facet. And eventually we will lead to this perfect space where we'll have not only accuracy that's being solved, but also interpretability, generalizability, fairness, robustness, um, and also I'll say importantly, environmental and, um, and financial costs. So with that, um, I want to thank my lab, um, who's been really very helpful in shaping these ideas and a lot of the research that's happening in, in my lab. I'm pointing primarily to Ash Kazemi, um, who's um, my um, PhD student, who's doing wonderful work in misinformation and NLP from, um, he's from Iran. And I'm happy to take now more questions. And see there are a number of questions here. I can um, go back to, there is a question on what I mean by stability. I mentioned that briefly, it's really just overlap in between neighbors. So taking a one word, we can look at the overlap between the neighbors that it has in one embedding space. So if we train an embedding, what neighbors we get versus another embedding space. Um, and the overlap between them would give us stability. So some words, for instance, have only an overlap of 40%, which is not very high stability. Others may have 90%, which is fairly high stability. Um, Another question refers to whether we could use probing and classification to measure stability um, instead of looking at nearest neighbors. Um, I think so. So there, there has been some other work on understanding embeddings, for instance, sentence embeddings through probing. And I think that is a interesting strategy to consider. It might not be as transparent as for instance, looking at nearest neighbors. So nearest neighbors, you can look at them, you can see what you get, what are nearest neighbors in one space versus another overlap. So it's pretty basic as a metric, but for that matter, it's also pretty transparent as compared to classification, where maybe it's the problem of the classification algorithm that I don't get very good results. So there is a layer of confounding um, factors there, uh, but I think it's an interesting idea to consider. Um, see another question on what is your opinion about semantic similarity using BERT models as opposed to more simple models such as word to vet um, Can we use conventional methods like cosine similarity with BERT? Um, so it really depends on the task. And I'm generally arguing very strongly in favor of not blindly making decisions just because this is what's fashionable. So nowadays, BERT is sort of more fashionable and to some extent for good reasons because they were found to be more effective for measuring similarity as they account for context. Um, but it doesn't mean that they are effective in every task. Um, and so in general for similarity, it was found that BERT works better, but it really depends on the setting that you are addressing. Um, like sometime, unless you do some training on your problem, then you may not really get much out of BERT. And so that's something to consider. Um, what is the cost of training or fine tuning BERT on your data? Or would you rather go with the simpler model? And word to vac I think has been found successful on a number of problems. There are papers nowadays that would compare um, these more regular word embeddings with contextualized word embeddings and um, try to point out with what are the situations where you should go with contextualize versus the more traditional word embeddings. I think those are very insightful. So it really depends on the problem or setting where that you try to solve. 
and how much compute, for instance, you can afford how much data you have. Um, there is another question on whether we can use linguistic information to improve embeddings. Um, there is very nice work on retrofitting embeddings to um, semantic networks. Um, and you know, Ed Hovey, Noah Smith, I believe, were co-authors on that paper, and there are several others. So that is an idea that I think stands and has a lot of potential, um, maybe even in even more explicit ways. So that was retrofitting to the graph structure of a um, lexical network, but there is more to do there. Um, there is another question on um, what is the stability evaluation metric. Um, so we use the we have a model, we, we have some data that we created, which had words and different domain, different, um, the, the domains that we are using to train. And we also had other properties of the word, like part of speech, properties of the algorithm, uh, and some properties of the data that was used for training. And this was passed through a regression. And so if this is what the question is asking, the metric that we use was how well we could fit on the data. So if the data were sort of random data points, then we wouldn't fit very well. Uh, if there was some cohesiveness in the data, then it would fit reasonably well. And that's what we found. There was something to be learned from this data, which meant that there were some relations between the factors that were, um, that were represented. Um, there is another question on uh, what do I suggest to, um, for NLP tasks in low resource languages such as Persian? Um, do you suggest to work on creating lexical resources or test different models um, or use linguistic information? I really think that really any research is making advance in that. Um, and in particular, research that is being made available for others to build upon, which I think it's critical for, in particular, for low resource languages, um, where it's important to form a community and build upon each other's work. Um, so it's, it's really, I shouldn't make recommendations because I really believe in one doing their best if they are passionate about what they do. So I shouldn't say, well, now go and look work on lexical resources when you are really passionate about machine translation and so forth. So I would say really any work would make a difference. Um, perhaps one key property would be to make as much as possible available. Um, like if there is a lexical resource that's being constructed, make it available so others can build upon that. The same for different models and, and so forth. And there's also a natural way of solving problems. So perhaps it's harder to solve uh, a problem that requires a um, parser and a lot of data and maybe some relations between words um, if you don't have the fundamental blocks. So, um, but again, I think passion and interest really makes the most difference and the most progress on, on the task. Um, So there is a question on what is the performance of linguistically annotated embeddings compared with generic embeddings. Um, the paper that I've been referring to, which is retrofitting embeddings to semantic networks has found that um, this linguistic, linguistically informed embedding would have better performance. Um, another comparison is between say, algorithms like BERT, which are contextually aware. So somehow encode more um, semantic or lexical information would do better than generic embedding. So in general, it's considered that if you in, ingest more linguistically informed linguistics, um, you'll get um, you'll get better uh, better embeddings. And I think there is a lot more to be done there. Um, also, with respect to, for instance, the question earlier, working on Persian, um, then maybe you. For certain domains, at least, you will not have a lot of data. So there is the question of how much benefit would 
linguistic information bring when you don't have a lot of data to train the embeddings. And my suspicion is that you will see even more gain from there as opposed to using a huge um, corpus where maybe adding linguistics helps some, which is what was found before, but not as much as if you start with a small corpus. Um, there is a question on specific stability of for certain languages. I'm afraid I cannot answer that. Um, we have stability calculated for about 40 languages, but probably will be hard for me to um, speak specifically about certain languages. Um, there is another question on um, BERT and GPT, GPT being state of the art. Have word embeddings like word to vec or glove. Um, are, I'm, I'm not sure I understand fully this question. Has word embedding like word to vec or glove their user efficiency on NLP task? I'm assuming if they still keep their efficiency. Um, so there are still people who would use um, word to vec and glove. And like I said before, it really depends on the setting that you are trying to solve. It's not that one algorithm is the sort of the magic for every single task. And it was found that there are differences um, in some tasks, but then in others, we don't really see that. So it, it still makes sense to go with traditional um, embeddings for a number of tasks where either not being able to afford in terms of data that we have or computational cost to train BERT or um, simply because traditional embeddings would be um, would be sufficient. Um, do you think that there will be a third generation of word embeddings after original word to back and bird? Um, I think so. Um, I think this has been ongoing. And again, word to back is claimed to be sort of the first word embedding, but it's really just a renaming. And we've seen a lot of these renamings. Um, so word embeddings really means word representation. We've seen word representations for a long time, sort of since the beginning of NLP. Um, and with that, we've also seen a lot of progress. It's not that we invented them in 2013, we named them this way, uh, but they've been around for 50 plus years and there has been consistent progress since. Maybe some periods of stagnation when there hasn't been a lot of change and then a, again, a lot of progress. Um, and so, yes, I think there will be more progress being done in word embeddings. My hope is that it will be more in the direction of the other facets, um, in the sense of creating representations that are more robust or more generalizable or more fair, uh, more environmental aware and so forth. So um, not only I believe there will be, I also hope we'll get um, better representations that are not only optimizing for accuracy. Um, another question, does word embedding change the way languages evolve over time? Uh, for example, the meaning and the sense of how words change over time um, to factors such as internet, social networks, and new technology. And this is a great question. Um, there is an evolution of algorithms, and that's what I was just saying earlier, and I think that will just continue. So we'll see new algorithms, which is really exciting. So it's really people like you who will make those changes and bring those third generation of word representations. Um, and then there is also an evolution in language. And there is very interesting work that looked at um, representations of words. Say if we draw representations from language from 1800, as we get it from books versus language now, we see changes in word senses and meanings um, in general and what is the connotation of certain words, uh, which I think is very interesting. So there are all like the two things that are evolving, algorithms and then also language. And so um, we will continue to see those changes, I'm, I'm sure, both in language and in algorithm. And so word embeddings um, will change over time because of these two factors. 
are embedding models limited by the tokenization um, applied in the training corpus? Um, and yeah, so really any kind of pre-processing you apply um, would change the kind of representation that you would get. So this is a very good point. Um, I guess you could say it's limited by the tokenization. It's really depending on the tokenization. So depending on how you consider, like what kind of word pieces you consider, um, it seems common practice to get uh, different word pieces um, but you could also go the other way around if you were to have enough data to combine words and create um, multi-word um, phrases. And so the resulting embeddings would very much depend on that. Okay, what is the word embeddings for morphologically rich language and other um, other languages. Um, that actually is related to the previous question that it really depends on how you process. So um, we've seen differences in different languages which have to do not only with morphology, so that is a big factor. And like I said, that's word in progress, but it's also having to do with other properties in the language. Um, there is this very nice Atlas of Linguistic Properties of Language, WALS, W-A-L-S, which includes different linguistic properties, like for instance, whether um, words are gendered or not, um, how are suffixes is used, how are prefix is used. Um, so there's a lot of these properties of language includes also morphological properties. And we've been exploring those and found associations, for instance, between um, stability of word embeddings and um, how morphologically rich a language is. And so, yes, there is, um, there are word embeddings for that. I really think a key part would be like what kind of pre-processing is being applied on the language prior to training and, and embedding. Um, can we use knowledge graphs in order to have the same embedding for different languages? So we could use, knowledge graph, and that even prior to talking about word embeddings, um, WordNet is an example of a semantic network. So you could also call it a knowledge graph, which has um, versions in different languages, and it also has an interlingua. So they are all connected. So you could draw connections um, between these knowledge graph, semantic networks in the different languages. Um, now one could think of a similar thing to create um, for embeddings. The question really is whether you want to do it through such a knowledge graph. So then you would want to somehow map the embeddings to the network. So maybe something like the retrofitting work, which tries to get um, the connection between thematic networks and the more data-driven word embeddings would be one way to go. So then the knowledge graphs would be the way of bridging between languages. And then there is this other work which sort of ignores that. It's really pouring a lot of data from different languages in the same neural network and training. And that also learns connections um, between, between languages. Um, now, whether that will connect different meanings of the same word in different languages, that's a different question. And there is work that we are doing in my lab, which I'm generally very fascinated about these cultural differences um, between worldviews and how the same word can be interpreted differently by different people. Um, so I'm not sure that this representation would capture that, but I think it's a very interesting and rich direction to go into. Because once you have bridges between languages, there is a lot you can do in terms of, for instance, um, transferring tools between languages and transferring resources and, and so forth. Okay, so I've been going around this question. What is your intuition about the future of word embeddings? Um, what is the next breakthrough? Um, I really think that is, and that's of course bias in itself as an answer um, by my own interest and work that I'm doing. I think it's really going in the direction of being, addressing all these classes that I've been talking about, 
I thought that would be a big breakthrough where we have embeddings that are more fair and robust and interpretable. And I also think it's going in the direction of creating embeddings that are more personalized. So we've seen contextualized embeddings, um, but I think the direction of personalized is also very rich and interesting. And I, by that, I don't mean personalized to an individual, uh, which may pose uh, privacy issues, but really personalized to a certain setting. So for instance, it could be uh, people who are interested in, in computer science or in NLP or people from a certain region of the world. And we've been seeing in a number of studies on how the meaning that words have for different words, or the meaning that words have for different groups of people, like different culture, or maybe people coming from different points in time, different ages, different interests would differ. And keeping this one size fits all approach, which is what currently we do in NLP, um, I don't really think that that's what would take us the farthest, but rather we want to move away from one size fits all and start creating representations that are more personalized to situations, whether it's a context or a group of people or certain event and so forth. So to me, that would be where sort of the next breakthroughs would, would come in. I don't know how much time we have. I think we are getting close. The end of our time. I would do apologize for the uh, for the attendees that we couldn't get the time to answer their uh, questions. I know that you have. I think it's almost one hour and a half of speaking. So uh, if you let me, I would call the uh, Q and A session. And I would like to thank you very much for the uh, valuable time that you've given to us. And it was, at least for me, it was very, very interesting, especially the, the, the environmental and the fairness part of the thing is, is quite a hot topic, uh, especially regarding the Google uh, departures that we heard in the news. And so it, it's a hot topic in whole community to think about. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I, I would like you. I would like to thank you, and I would let the, everyone know that once the recording is ready, we will make it available through an email. Also, we have a survey at the end of the um, talk. That okay, sorry. Uh, could could you hear me? I was talking for I think one minute. Not that, uh, yes, except for the last one minute or so. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Yes, most of everything uh, thank else. Thank you very much. I would like uh, to thank you. And I know that uh, you were, I mean, speaking one hour and a half now, and uh, it was really insightful for us. Uh, uh, also, I want to thank Dr. Shamsberg to, uh, that uh, organized uh, these talks and also the, the team uh, members of the NLP lab. Uh, that helped us to do this. Uh, also, I want to invite all of you on the next session, which uh, uh, Professor Navigli will uh, present to us uh, on the, in the same series of the talk. Uh, thank you very much. And that's it. If any points left by you or uh, Mehnush, we will hear it. And then we will end I just this. wanted to say many thanks to Arnush and Ashan and everyone for the wonderful questions. I, I really enjoyed it and thanks for all the interactions. Um, thank you. I, I would also like to thank Rada for her great and wonderful talk and uh, also my colleagues in NLP Lab uh, for running the webinar and um, also all the attendees for joining us. And I uh, hope to meet all of you in the next webinar on 23rd of June uh, with Professor Roberto Navigli on a topic related to word sense disambiguation. Uh, have a good time and um, thank you very much. Bye. 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 Have a nice day, everyone, night, or whatever. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye.
Thank you. I'm stopping the recording.